morning, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, the content executive here at Higher Things. And joining me today is a, a brand new guest. This is Pastor James Hopkins. He is a senior pastor at uh, First Lutheran Church. He is also a, a, a Navy chaplain. He gets to work with campus ministry. He gets to talk to a lot, a lot of really cool people. And I got to talk to him. And uh, it, it was a really, really interesting conversation. So I thought that we would we would, we would would share it with you. How are you doing today, Pastor? Hey, good afternoon. Yeah, just turned afternoon out here in uh, lovely Boston. Uh, beautiful day. Uh, just headed into church right now. Just did a, a funeral for the Navy. And uh, a wonderful afternoon of, you know, talking to uh, to young folks in our uh, campus ministry environment. And yeah, getting ready for Sunday, all the, all the good pastor stuff and campus ministry stuff. It's the day-to-day -day stuff, but at the same time, um, you get to cut, sort of come face-to-face -to -face with basically everybody that uh, we sort of have been taught that we need to prepare ourselves for if we're going to, to witness to, if we're going to share the faith with, if we're even going to protect our own faith in these communities, in, um, in a, a, well, a government organization, in, in a campus, uh, a college campus that is uh, highly intellectualized <laughs> yeah. uh, in, in all of these places. And so we got to talk a little bit uh, last week, and uh, it, it was really actually kind of refreshing for me because you just spelled a lot of the myths that sort of go into it, that, that you have to be the smartest person in the room, that you have to have an answer to every single question, that that um, if you yeah. just do things a certain way, everything will always work out. Um, I, I guess one of the things I'd really like to talk today about is, especially in campus ministry, what helps? Like what what, what helps and, and what tends to, to not help near as much as we think it will? Yeah. So uh, people are people wherever you go, and they have different uh, things that are going to upset them or get in the way of a faithful witness. And you can't predict that for everybody, but I can tell you some of the trends I've observed. Hmm. Um, one is that you, something you and I were talking about just before you hit record, and that is authenticity. Uh, that's not just authenticity about the church and your confession. It's also, you know, authenticity about yourself and people in the congregation and not pretending to be something that you're not. I think there's a temptation in a place like Boston to uh, go ahead and try to make everything uh, hyper intellectual mm -hmm. because that's what we imagine everybody wants and or needs or finds worthy. And uh, this has not been the case. Uh, one of the things that I've discovered since I've gotten here is that uh, doctors of chemical engineering and political philosophy uh, and so on and so forth don't need uh, a different gospel. And it seems like the more you kind of explain it, the more it se you seem to actually be explaining it away because you just kind of, de uh, you know, degrade it into the same sorts of uh, categories that they're used to working in. Hmm. But you can't you can't lay out the gospel that way. It's not like a cadaver on a table to be dissected, right? It's it's a living voice and a living word of Jesus. It, it makes sense. I mean, it's it's how the church started that that uh, the apostles were sent out not to explain away the gospel or, or to, to sort of find a way to make it the same thing as everything else that they the, the people that they interacted with believed even though this was a brand new thing that a guy stopped being dead um and, and for us in the same yeah. way when we get to go out into campus um we get to recognize if, if it's not your job to be the smartest person in the room it's actually kind of a gift if you don't happen to be and, and for me that's a huge gift because i'm never the smartest person in the room but i'm always a sinner that jesus died for that that's a thing that that we get to share not just here, but everywhere, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, it helps to be able to listen and kind of speak their language and learn where they're coming from and what sort of obstacles that lie between them and and the faith. And, you know, here we kind of enter the realm of apologetics a little bit, but, uh, you know, definitely not to make too many assumptions at the first. And I, I'm frequently surprised by how when I get across from somebody, I think I know what their problem is going to be. Mm -hmm. I think I know what their objection is going to be. And if I listen long enough, I find that uh, I'm, I'm completely wrong. Right. That was uh, one of the hardest questions uh, that I learned to ask as a pastor is, why do you want to know? Because like, I know what I would think to say to this, but just to sort of like, say, why are you asking this? What, what, why are you talking about this? And, and, and politely, not as an, an accusation, but just like, what are we actually driving at? Because people aren't keeping it a secret. They, they just sort of need to have a, it framed in a way that they can actually hear it. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. And 
uh, that hearing, I mean, a lot of different things kind of, uh, to sound a bit cliche, plant the seed for people here. So I've had uh, people come from other realms of Christianity, uh, Pentecostalism, from Reformed congregations, from Roman Catholicism, you name it, but also, you know, from far outside Christianity, from uh, Buddhism, from Islam. And what's funny, and I think this is something I shared with you last week, is how frequently God uh, makes a gentle mockery of all my plans and all my strategies and visions and programs. Because, you know, I find that uh, a woman uh, discovered a book about the Reformation in a library uh, that maybe shouldn't have been on the shelf somewhere in Iran and learned about Christianity kind of through a historical lens about the Reformation and then arrived at a uh, at a high profile institution here to do a postdoc, read a Bible and believed it. It's because weird that that can happen. Isn't it weird that uh, God uh, works through the ways that he's said he's going to work and creates faith in her? And then she, you know, just sought me for instruction to to fill that out and talk about Christian doctrine and what it means to to live as a Christian. And, and you know, I got to baptize that person months later. Um, amen. Another uh, person hears the gospel in one of the Bach cantatas. Our congregation has a very strong musical program. Uh, f- where lots of people come from all over Boston and sometimes all over the world to uh, to hear, you know, tremendous uh, music that has been gifted us through the ages. And they're great fans of people like Bach, even though they're not great fans of Jesus yet, uh, which and they don't understand the, the discontinuity there. But uh, I have the opportunity to preach uh, for those people and uh, demonstrate uh, the Lord and present him, you know, who Bach worshiped and that, that opens up a lot of rows and a lot of conversations. And even without my preaching, a woman just heard the gospel in a Bach cantata and believed it and uh, then read the Bible and believed the Bible and God be praised. Like, so this is, uh, and all of this without my labor, right? Yeah. I go and I, I water and I nourish and I feed and so on. Uh, but God has done all of this while I sleep. It's an important thing that, that you can kind of relax a little bit because Jesus cares about this even more than you do. Um, if it's going to be yours to carry, then it's going to be your your fault every much every bit as much as we sort of want to take credit for for the perks. But um, if if it's God at work to to keep yeah. to, to grow to to care for His church, well, then when we start to talk about it in the places that aren't necessarily uh, as safe feeling because of the way that things are phrased now, because like we we have um, Luther characterizes this as the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh, and the reality is the devil was defeated at the cross. For all that that we we sort of talk about him, the the lion who prowls about seeking those whom he may devour has no teeth for you, Christian, because you're baptized. You wear the armor of God. Uh, Luther, you know, makes quotes about you know farting in the direction of the devil and the sinful flesh is. Like it's 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 every single day something we wage war with, but we wage war in the forgiveness of sins. That your church is overly equipped to forgive your sins. Your pastor will absolve you, and then sins are gone. That that we're making a big deal out of this thing that Jesus has already conquered. And then when it comes to the world, when we talk about places like uh, high academia, like like government institutions, like 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 the military, it's the world. But well, hasn't Christ risen from the dead there, and and hasn't He promised to send forth His Spirit into the world? It, it makes it a, a much more joyful task. I got to imagine. <laughs> That's right. And and in the same way that I can uh, laugh about how my programs and ideas and stuff like that don't work, uh, also rest uh, in, in Christ when the proclamation does not yield what I want it to yield. When somebody it looks you know very promising and this is all working out, we're having great conversations and they're really interested. And that person learns that, you know, he doesn't get to have a bunch of illicit sex outside of marriage. And, you know, I could feel in that person, something like, uh, you know, Augustine, God, make me a Christian, but not yet. Not not yet. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, and, and so far, right. I'm like that person understood that the Christian life looks, does look a certain way. And uh, that was, that was too much for now, but the spirit's still at work. The spirit's still at work. I could I could see that person again. Uh, and someone else might too. And I, you know, th- there's something to be said about about persistence and 
so on. But I'm I'm always surprised and ever more surprised at the reasons people end up in church. And yeah, just preaching, not to reduce it, but law and gospel really matters. Absolutely. And it works on the heart of everyone. So what would you say to a, a kid in high school who's getting ready to go off to college, working in campus ministry? What What's your, your advice? Yeah, to be active, especially if you're coming and you're entering into an undergraduate situation. My experience uh, with campus ministry so far is that we get the most robust participation from grad students and people who came out of the grad programs. Uh, but if you want to stay tethered to the faith and you dear listener need to stay tethered to the faith um you need to be active in there not just receive a gift basket uh and go you know one sunday when your parents come and check in on you you need to be actively involved uh with that local congregation and the campus ministry that they provide you really do need to go to like Bible studies and make a priority of that community because those people want to live alongside you and encourage you in the faith that you have been given. And I mean, I don't want to sound too cynical and I, I know not everybody is actively malicious towards, towards you, but uh, the devil and the world out there do want to destroy your faith. Mm -hmm. And if you are not tethered to that congregation and that body of saints that Christ has given you, uh, your chances of falling away are remarkably high. Right. And, and you've, even if managed somehow to escape the world and the devil, which you're not going to, you've got your own sinful flesh too. Um, that, that every single yeah. week, yeah, you're, you're going to be in a place where you're still a sinner who needs Jesus. And so if you know where Jesus is, this is, this is where Christians go. I, I don't imagine the advice would be terribly different if you enlisted either, but as a chaplain, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, as a child, it's it's kind of a a different environment, the military, and and they're not the same, right? Despite we, the fact that we can say the military, I'm a chaplain in the Navy, and there's uh, you know the the Army and the Air Force and so on out there. Um, so everybody's going to find themselves selves in a different context. If you are stateside, right, and you're on one of our bases, uh, there's a Missouri Synod congregation close to you. Mm -hmm. Go go to it. Go be fed in word and sacrament. Go there. Because um, that's probably where you're going to find a Missouri Senate chaplain on a Sunday, too, if there is one on that base or installation or what have you. Uh, you know, when you're forward, that is when you're deployed and so on, uh, seek out the chaplain. If it's not a Lutheran, you know, Missouri Synod pastor, uh, then, you know, go ahead and let iron sharpen iron and you can attend a Bible study and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, have your have your guard up, be listening carefully uh, that pure doctrine would be proclaimed and also understand that part of that chaplain's job is to facilitate for you the services you require. So you should not be receiving the Lord's Supper from the hand of that chaplain, you know, who's not been called to serve you, you as a Lutheran. Uh, but that chaplain's job is to make sure somebody can to find a Missouri Synod pastor to give you the Lord's Supper. The way back in 2004, when I was in Afghanistan, uh, Chaplain Greg Todd was giving me the Lord's Supper at a forward operating base in the middle of nowhere, Afghanistan, a little place called Tyron Kut, uh, while the Taliban was lobbing mortars at us, and he was giving me uh, the medicine of immortality. So that's what chaplains are for. This is always what, what the church does, though. It, it goes out into the place where people are and need Jesus and, and gives Jesus. Um, God be praised for it. Amen. Pastor Hopkins, thanks so much for joining us today. It was really great to talk to you. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me on. Have a great day.